Colonel Hanneken was chagrined. He could see the enemy putting men and supplies ashore, but they were too far away for immediate action. He decided to attack at dawn. He did, and his marines collided with Japanese soldiers marching west to Koli. Both sides recoiled, but the Japanese snapped back faster. They struck the Americans with light howitzers and mortars while working a force around to their rear. Hanneken withdrew. He pulled back across the Metapona to the west bank of the Nalimbiu, where he had communications wire connecting him with the perimeter. He notified Vandergrift of his predicament and was told to expect aerial assistance. It came, and it hit Hanneken's men. Hanneken called for an end to aerial assistance, and it was cancelled. And then Vandergrift ordered Hanneken to hold, while General Rupertus came over from Tulagi to take command. Martin Clemens watched his second set of signal pyramids lose its brilliance with the arrival of first light of November 4th. Then he saw a quartet of old American four-stack destroyers entering the bay. Farther out were transports guarded by destroyers. Soon landing boats swung out from the four-stackers, and the raiders of Lieutenant Colonel Evans Carlson went down into them. They came roaring ashore and the raiders leaped out to go racing up the beach with fixed bayonets. They had been told to land as though opposed, and they fanned out quickly into the jungle. Martin Clemens watched them in amusement, for he was by then one of the old breed of American marine. He had been there when the stuff hit the fan, and he had the right to say, as the first marine in history is reputed to have said to the second marine, Listen, boot, you should have been here when it was really rough and so he was prepared when a raider racing toward him, and Michael came to an astonished halt at the sight of the Englishman in his slouch hat and the native with the face full of scars. What kind of disease is that? the raider asked, pointing at Michael. Bomb disease. Clemens snorted, turning to watch with tolerant disdain the arrival of the rest of Admiral Turner's well-dressed and well-fed Johnny-come-latelys. Not all of the American transports stopped at Iola. Some moved farther west to Lunga Point, bringing General Vandergrift a pair of welcome acquisitions, the 8th Marine Regiment and two batteries of 155mm Long Tom rifles. The Long Toms meant that the days of Pistol Pete's unchallenged reign were numbered, for the 155 rifles could outshoot the Japanese 150mm howitzers. The 8th Marines meant that the attack in the west could be renewed, as soon as Rupertus could clear up the situation in the east. Listening to reports from Hanneken and Clemens's scouts, General Rupertus wisely concluded that there were quite a few Japanese to the east. He decided to hold at the Nalimbiu until Chesty Puller's battalion could come down coast by boat to take the enemy in his sea flank, while Colonel Bryant Moore took the 164th Infantry south to turn north and take the Japanese on his landward flank. Late that day, November 4th, the operation began. To the west, that same day, November 4th, soldiers of the 228th Infantry Regiment of the Japanese 38th Division were marching to General Hyakutake's rescue. Seventeen destroyers had landed them at Kamimbo and Tassafaronga early that morning. As they came ashore, Major General Takeo Ito, the 38th's infantry commander, turned them east to Kukumbona. Meanwhile, General Hayakutake radioed Colonel Shoji at Tetere and ordered him to join him in the west. Shoji was dismayed at having to forego the chance to avenge the Sendai. Nevertheless, he left a rear guard of 500 men at Gavaga Creek and began swinging around Henderson Field along the trail cut by the Kawaguchi Brigade. Rupertus tried to cut him off with Colonel Moore's two battalions of the 164th Infantry. But these units, having blundered into each other at night and fought a bloodless battle between them, were unable to halt more than a handful of Shoji's men. The main body, perhaps 3,000 men, had escaped. Gung Ho. In Chinese it means work together, and Evans Carlson had learned it during his pre-war service with the Chinese Eighth Route Army. After taking command of the second raiders and weeding out the faint-hearted with the question, could you cut a Jap's throat without flinching? Carlson gave them gung-ho as both slogan and battle cry. One day the phrase would come to mean a marine esprit bordering on chauvinism, 
and that would be partially as a result of the fury with which Carlson's raiders scourged the men of Colonel Shoji's column in a month-long private war of their own. Guided through the jungle by native scouts under the command of Sergeant Major Vuza, depending upon native carriers to lug the ammunition and rations of rice, raisins and bacon that were periodically parachuted to them along the way, they killed 500 of Shoji's men at a loss of only 17 of their own, and they did this with a single, simple tactic, which Carlson had also learned in China. His main body marched, unseen, in a column parallel with the Japanese. His patrols followed directly behind the enemy. Each time the patrols encountered large numbers of Japanese, they opened fire. As Colonel Shoji began to rush reinforcements to his rear, Carlson's men struck from the flank with all their firepower. Then they vanished. Twelve times Carlson's raiders savaged the enemy in this fashion, and by the time Colonel Shoji's haggard and reeling column reached Kukumbona, Guadalcanal was known in their language not only as Gashima or Hunger Island, but also as Shishima, Death Island. On November 5th, the day the lean and passionate Carlson led his men in pursuit of Colonel Shoji, Admiral Tanaka arrived in the shortlands. Two runs of the Tokyo Express had already made those landings at Gavaga Creek and in the west, and Tanaka immediately prepared another one. On November 7th, 11 destroyers were to take 1,300 men of the 38th Division to Tassafaronga. Tanaka hoped to lead the sortie personally, but Admiral Mikawa insisted that he remain in the shortlands. Tanaka was needed to plan additional runs of the Tokyo Express scheduled for November 8th, 9 and 10. In all, two cruisers and 65 destroyers were to be involved in these shipments. Finally, the biggest convoy of all, 11 big fast transports carrying half the 38th Division, was to leave on November 13, after Admiral Kondo's battleships and cruisers had made powder and hash of Henderson Field. So the 11 destroyers set sail without him, taking the northern route above the Solomon chain. They would arrive at Tassafaronga at midnight of November 7th. November 7th dawned bright and hot. Martin Clemens decided it was a good day to return to the perimeter from Aula. The army battalion there had set up a defensive line, and the Seabees were already at work building roads. Clemens decided there was nothing more that he could do, and he was anxious to resume his interrupted duties as chief recruiter and straw boss for a force of native Steve Dawes. He had planned to bring back a prisoner or two with him, but Wimpy Wendling, an exuberant marine marksman, had shot holes in that hope. Wendling and four scouts had gone to Koilotomaria to round up a few of the Japanese missed in the last foray. They had found four, but instead of capturing them, they had killed them. Wendling reported that he had attempted to persuade a wounded English-speaking officer to surrender. The officer refused. Wendling advanced, offering a chocolate bar. The Japanese whipped out his sabre and swung. Fortunately, Wimpy explained, his finger was still on the trigger. So Clemens led his party into their landing boat and sailed west for Lunga. A mile offshore, the lookout called, White Water to Starboard. Clemens was surprised. He knew there were no reefs in the vicinity. He raised his glasses to look for the white water and saw a bubbling wake leading straight into the side of the supply ship Majaba. A huge column of water spouted into the sky, followed by a roar. Majaba listed, holed by the Japanese submarine, 120. Sinking fast, she staggered ashore and beached herself, later to be salvaged and patched up. Destroyers dashed about, their sterns digging deep into the water, depth charges arching off their fantails and geysers of water marking the underwater explosions. Dive bombers came hurtling down too, and Wendling jumped up on the prow to wave a huge American flag, just in case some inexperienced dauntless pilot should mistake a Higgins boat for an enemy barge. They reached Lunga and found that they had beached right next to a Japanese torpedo. It lay on the beach, long, silvery and wicked, still hot and steaming from its futile run at Majaba. A bomb disposal officer was at work dismantling it. Clemens walked back to his tent, wondering if it were possible to find a safe spot or pass a dull day on Guadalcanal. November 7th had seemed like a dull day at Henderson Field. 
It seemed that the aerial doldrums begun after the Battle of Santa Cruz were going to continue, until coast watchers radioed reports of eleven enemy destroyers slipping down the top of the Solomons. Major Paul Fontana led his newly arrived squadron of marine fighters aloft first, and after him came Captain Joe Foss with more wildcats. About 150 miles to the north, Foss saw the specks of the enemy ships crawling over the flat obsidian surface of the sea like a file of ants. Then he saw six float Zeros flying escort. The Zeros struck boldly at the American bombers, trying to ruin their aim as they screamed down on Admiral Tanaka's skillfully manoeuvring ships. Some of their bombs scored direct hits on destroyers Takanami and Naganami, inflicting major damage and killing troops. But no ships were sunk, and the Tokyo Express sailed on toward Tassafaronga. The Zeros were not so fortunate. Don't look now! Joe Foss yelled by radio to his pilots, but I think we have something here. They went zooming down in attack, practically jostling each other, giving each other the aerial elbow in their eagerness not to be left out in the scramble of seven wildcats for six zeros. Foss shot the first one, blowing it into an aerial dust bag, and then they were all gone. Foss looked up. He could see five empty parachutes ballooning gently downward. He wondered where the pilots were. Then he saw a sixth shoot with an enemy pilot dangling from the harness. The pilot unbuckled himself and plummeted headfirst into the sea, and there were six clouds of empty silk swaying gently in the sky. Strange enemy indeed, Foss thought, and prepared to go down to strafe the destroyers. Grasping the stick, he made his customary quick survey of the clouds, and saw a pontoon protruding from a bit of fluff above him. He went up after it and found a single-motored biplane scout. He came in close, missed, and was raked by the scout's rear gunner. Wind came howling through a hole in his windscreen. Foss came back and shot the scout into the sea. He caught a second scout by surprise and sent it down like a torch, and then his motor began to fade and spout smoke, and Foss realised that he was far from home and coming down into the sea near Malaita Island. Two or three miles offshore, his tail hooked into the water, his plane skipped, bounced, came down hard, nosed over, and began to sink like a stone. Foss was trapped. Water poured into his cockpit with the force of a sledgehammer, knocking him groggy. The plane was plunging toward the bottom of the sea, but Foss could not get out. He had forgotten to unhook his parachute leg strap and now water was underneath both his chute harness and his inflated life vest, making him so buoyant he could not reach the leg strap. Still descending, he became frantic and caught his foot under the seat. He was going to drown if he did not calm himself. Holding off death with iron self-control, he straightened, pushed down with all his strength, freed the foot and strap, and shot upward through a crushing weight of water but the leg straps of the chute harness were still buckled. They brought Foss to the surface behind up and face down. He gulped mouthfuls of seawater. He swallowed more, unbuckling the straps. Then his preserver shot up over his mouth and he took in more. Still thrashing about, Foss undid his shoes and felt himself become more buoyant. He tried to swim toward Malaita, but the current was too strong and he was barely staying in place. A big black tail fin cut the water a few feet to the side of him. Another slid past on the other side. Foss remembered the chlorine capsule in his pocket. It was supposed to keep the sharks away. He grasped it and broke it. In another hour it was dark, and the sharks were back. They were all around him. Within the darkening stadium in Washington, D.C., the floodlights were just coming on. They came on at about the time that Joe Foss and his fellow Marines roared aloft to intercept the Tokyo Express. And as the stadium blossomed with light and the uniforms of the football players became more brilliant and the thick carpet of grass beneath their feet turned a brighter green, the loudspeaker crackled and blared. The President of the United States announces the successful landing on the African coast of an American expeditionary force. This is our second front. A single great cry of national pride went reverberating around the arena. The football players went cartwheeling and hand-pringing down the middle of the field. America, 
agonizing over prospects of fresh disaster in the Pacific, was looking eagerly away to a new theatre. Then the Whistler Blue and the sobering players lined up for the kickoff. Little splashes of phosphorescence indicated to Joe Foss the places where the sharks were. He barely moved, fearing that if he extended an arm to swim, he would withdraw a spouting stub. Other splashes became audible farther away. They sounded like paddles. Peering through the murk, Foss saw a canoe and a native gondola coming toward him. Were they Japanese? Foss stayed motionless among the sharks and his fears. The boats passed to either side. Foss saw a lantern. For nearly a half hour, the lantern swayed eerily about him as the canoe and the gondola continued their search. A voice said, Let's look over here, and Joe Foss's heart leaped. Yeah, he bellowed, right over here. The lantern winked out, and on the gondola above him, Foss thought he saw natives raising war clubs, and he knew he heard them jabbering wildly. Friend, Foss yelled, Birdman, Aviator, American. Suddenly there was the man with the lantern above him, and friendly arms were outstretched toward him. Foss grasped them. They were those of Tommy Robinson, an Australian sawmill operator, and he pulled Foss into the canoe. Another man, in clerical clothing, said, I'm Father de Steinberg, just as a flying fish leapt from the sea and smashed the lantern. Foss gaped at the fish. It was twenty inches in length with a long, sharp needle of a bill. I should have kept this thing down, Robinson said apologetically, but I guess I got the wind up a bit. Many a bloke has lost his eyes at night because of holding lights. Foss shuddered and instinctively put his hand over his eyes, shivering again while Robinson cheerfully advised him that he had been wise to remain offshore with his friends, the sharks. If he had come ashore at the point he had been hoping to reach, he would have had to ford a stagnant stream full of crocodiles. The boats made for Boomer Mission. Foss was welcomed ashore by Bishop Orbin and another bishop who was Russian, as well as a Norwegian planter, four priests from as many different countries, and two brothers, one from Emmitsburg, Iowa, and eight sisters, one from Boston. They fed him and gave him dry clothes and a bed. It was not really a bed, rather the lumpy pad of an ascetic monk with a rock-like sack for a pillow, but Joe Foss slept well on it. Except for a bad few minutes at midnight when he awoke sick and retching from the seawater he had swallowed. It smells of exhibitionism, Bull Halsey said. To hell with it. The Admiral was on Guadalcanal. He had come there Sunday, November 8th, and he was, with customary bluntness, rejecting his staff's suggestion that he stand up in his jeep and wave or do something to make his presence known to the island's ragged defenders. Halsey would not, for he had seen their faces, and he would not insult them by crowing, in effect. Give a cheer, Halsey's here. So he drove without fanfare to Vandergrift's headquarters. Vandergrift took him on tour of the battlegrounds and treated him to a dinner which so impressed the Admiral that he asked to see the cook. Butch Morgan appeared. His red moustache was carefully brushed. He wore clean khaki trousers and his skivvy shirt was immaculate. He stood ramrod straight while Commander, South Pacific, praised his cooking, until, reddening and fidgeting apace with the Admiral's encomiums, he finally burst out, Oh, bullshit! Admiral, you don't have to say that. Joe Foss also enjoyed his dinner that Sunday. He had been to the thatched chapel, and he had also been put on display for the benefit of curious natives. The fathers had asked him to stand between two huts while the Malatans passed by to examine him. Short, with powerful muscles rippling beneath purply black skin, they not only made a striking contrast to the tall, fair American, they seemed very much amazed that there was a difference at all. One of the priests explained that many years before the war, an American schooner had stopped at Malaita with a crew of southern Negroes. They had told the Malaitans that they were Americans, and so the islanders had expected Foss to be black. Foss was not surprised. One of the sisters he had spoken to had never seen an automobile, and the first airplanes she saw were those that flew and fought overhead. Hardly any of the missionaries knew anything of the war going on across the slot, to say nothing of what had happened in the world during the past few decades, 
and that was why, as Foss sat down to dinner, they pressed him to stay with them for two weeks. Foss thought he might stay a week. He could fish and inspect the wrecked Japanese planes in the hills, until he heard the familiar roar of a Catalina's motors, and he rushed down the steps of the dining hall built on stilts to find that his friend, Major Jack Cram, had come for him. Joe Foss went back to the war. He left his silk parachute for the sisters to sew into clothing. He promised to bring his hosts some tobacco, and he went out to the Catalina in a native canoe, returning to that Henderson field from which, during the weeks to come, he would rise to score his 26th aerial victory and tie the record set by Captain Eddie Rickenbacker in World War I. Behind him, the Malitans had begun to chant vespers. Across the bay, Washing Machine Charlie and the Tokyo Express bellowed a martial vespers to introduce Admiral Halsey to Guadalcanal at night. The Admiral sat out the performance in General Vandergrift's dugout, rising during a lull to strike a sandbag with a knuckly fist. Stout structure you have here, Archie, Halsey grunted, and then the all-clear sounded and both men left. Behind them, staff officers stared in wonderment at the stout sandbag which had just burst and was pouring sand on the floor with a weary sigh. The departure of Charlie and the Express did not mean that marines on the ridge directly behind Vandergrift's dugout could also go back to sleep, as had the Admiral and the General. No, it meant, rather, that now they could emerge in dripping discontent from the watery pits in which they had taken shelter, to pass a few unharassed hours squatting on their haunches, while hoping the customary but rarely fulfilled hope that the rain would stop and they might dry off. Private Juergens began to swear. He swore at the enemy with an ardent fluency, making masterly use of that ugly four-letter word without which most marines, like handcuffed orators, are speechless. Suddenly they were all on their feet, howling foul epithets at the enemy, real or imagined, in the dark jungle below them. They called Emperor Hirohito a buck-toothed rascal, and they suggested that Premier Tojo impale himself upon the Japanese caudal appendage, and then, up from the jungle, a reedy high voice screeched back in outrage, F! Babe Ruth! Chesty Puller was being evacuated from Gavaga Creek. The day before, he had led his battalion of marines in the western push against Gavaga, while Moore's soldiers attacked from the south and Hanukkah hit from the west. The enemy had replied with an artillery barrage. Fragments from an exploding shell tore into Pula's lower body and his legs. He was knocked flat. Bleeding freely, he called to a nearby Marine. Call headquarters, old man. I can't, sir. The line's been cut. Pula staggered erect to help repair the break, and a sniper shot him twice in the arm. Pula sank to the ground again. His men placed him on a poncho, dug a foxhole and lowered him gently into it. He spent the night there. In the morning a corpsman came to tie an evacuation tag to Puller's uniform. Puller snatched it away, snarling, Go label a bottle with that tag. I can go under my own power. Puller arose unsteadily and limped a thousand yards down the trail to the beach. He sank to the ground again. To his agonised dismay, he could not, in front of his men, go farther. His proud spirit could no longer goad his weakening flesh, and he had to crawl into the landing boat. Sailing down the coast in a fog of pain, he could hear the firing signalling the beginning of the end for the enemy at Gavaga. On November 9th, while Chesty Puller was taken by jeep to the primitive hospital inside the perimeter, Admiral Halsey held a press conference. A newsman asked how long he thought the Japanese would continue to fight. How long can they take it? Halsey snapped. Another reporter asked the Admiral how he proposed to conquer. Kill Japs, kill Japs, and keep on killing Japs, he shot back. Later, Halsey decorated some of Vandergrift's officers and men. He met the General's staff, and also Martin Clemens. Turning to drive to the runway, Halsey said, Well, Clemens, you carry on. We've got to beat these goddamn little yellow rascals. At the airfield, Halsey said farewell with twinkling eyes. Vandergrift, he said, don't you do a thing to that cook. Then he was gone, and a few hours later, Archer Vandergrift had resumed the attack in the West. The arrival of the 8th Marines under Colonel Hall Yeshke had prompted Vandergrift to renew his push toward Kukumbona. 
He sent this force to join Arthur, holding the blocking position with his own 2nd Marines and a battalion of the 164th. But the attack, begun in the afternoon, bogged down in a furious rainfall. Next day the sun was blazing, and the 8th Marines, like all new arrivals on Guadalcanal, wilted in its heat. On the following day, the sun shone even more fiercely. Although it did not deter the veteran units at Gavaga Creek, who finally reduced the enemy pocket, killing 350 Japanese at a loss of 40 Americans dead and 120 wounded, the heat again slowed Colonel Arthur's advance. So did General Hyakutake's well-entrenched, stubborn and enlarged forces. By mid-afternoon only 400 yards had been gained. By that time also General Vandergrift had been informed by Admiral Halsey that a great fleet had sailed from Truk. Presumably it was going to join other large forces gathering at Rabol and in the shortlands. Later that day, two furious air raids signalled the end of the aerial doldrums and underlined Halsey's warning. Once again, Archer Vandergrift was forced to shift from an offensive to a defensive stance. He recalled his troops from both fronts. He strengthened his lines. He tried to conceal his apprehension, but with little success. Anyone who had been on Guadalcanal long enough could read the signs. They knew at Henderson Field, along the beaches and the riverbanks, atop the ridges and down in the gloom of the jungle. They knew, as they had always known, that the breaking point had to be reached some time. And this was it. For the first time since the Japanese garrison on Tulagi had sent its last heartbreaking message, praying for everlasting victory, Japan's army and navy had drawn up a plan that was concentrated rather than dispersed, detailed rather than complicated. Admiral Yamamoto had placed Vice Admiral Nobutake Kondo in command of an armada of two aircraft carriers, four battleships, 11 cruisers, 49 destroyers, 11 transports, and 14,000 men. The troops were to augment General Hayakutake's 17th Army, which in mid-November at last outnumbered Vandergrift's forces by 30,000 to 23,000. Some 3,000 of the reinforcements comprised a combined naval landing force, while the remaining 11,000 formed the main body of the 38th Division. They were to land on the morning of November 13, after Henderson Field had been bombarded night and day. The first barrage was to be delivered on the night of November 12-13 to by Vice Admiral Hiroaki Abe, with battleships Hiei and Kirishima, cruiser Nagara and 14 destroyers. Gunichi Mikawa, with six cruisers and six destroyers, would bombard during the daylight of November 13, while a convoy of 11 high-speed army transports, escorted by 12, Tokyo Express destroyers under Tanaka the Tenasius put the troops ashore at Tasafaronga. Throughout this operation, Admiral Kondo with carriers Hiyo and Junyo, battleships Haruna and Congo and other ships, would sail in distant support about 150 miles north of Savo. Hiyo's and Junyo's airplanes would of course bomb Henderson Field in concert with the Eagles from Rabaul. Thus the major assault and landing plan, simplified at last, with the knockout blow to be delivered all at once in big ships, as Gunichi Mikawa had argued in that late August of long ago. And among its details, finally, was the destruction of the Allied coast-watching network on Bougainville. Japan now knew to what disastrous degree her movements of ships and aircraft had been made known to the Americans. Because she did, aircraft from Rabaul or New Ireland rarely flew above the slot now, and ships sailed south on three different routes. Nevertheless, coast watchers continued to operate close to fields such as Buin, and it was very difficult to conceal the gathering of a great armada from those numerous native scouts who, as the Japanese also now realised, were not harmless civilians in laplaps, but rather very dangerous enemy spies. Since trapping the scouts themselves was obviously impossible, or at least impractical, the Japanese decided to strike at the organising brains behind them. Jack Red in the north of Buainville and Paul Masson in the south at Buin were to be caught and killed. Hunting dogs were shipped into Buin and kept there in a wire cage while a patrol of a hundred soldiers was brought up from the island's southern tip at Kahili. Mason's scouts quickly discovered the dogs and Mason signalled their location to the Americans. A Catalina flew over Buin and dropped a bomb. Killed the lot! 
Mason signalled cheerfully, before departing Buin for the towering green-black mountains that ran down Bougainville's north-south spine. After him came the Japanese patrol. Between the two moved the ever-faithful scouts, reporting every enemy movement or sending the patrol panting up the wrong slopes. Exhausted, convinced that no effete westerner could survive in such horrible terrain, the Japanese withdrew. Paul Mason returned to his hideout in Buin. He resumed broadcasting with a report of the enemy's failure. Then he sent this ominous message. At least 61 ships this area. Two Nati-class cruisers, one Aoba, one Mogami, one Kiso, one Tatuta, two sloops, 33 destroyers, 17 cargo, two tankers, one passenger liner of 8,000 tons. It was this message. Joined to the reports of tirelessly searching flying forts and Catalinas, which sent the last American carrier force in the Pacific tearing north again. Big E was coming back to battle a cripple, but coming back because Bull Halsey was throwing even half ships and cockle shells into America's desperate struggle to save Guadalcanal. Since the day Enterprise had staggered from Santa Cruz into the hill girdled harbour of Noumea, a battalion of CBs, all of repair ship Vulcan's crew, and the carrier's own craftsmen had been working around the clock to put her back in shape. Enterprise had lain there beside the dozing little French colonial town with its dainty white replica of Notre Dame de Paris crowning the harbour, while her decks rattled to the incessant pounding of air hammers, while even the knights winked and twinkled with the spark and sputter of welders' torches, and while other ships sped north with the last of Admiral Halsey's available troops. Six thousand of them, marines and soldiers of the 182nd Infantry Regiment, had been rushed to Guadalcanal to even the 30,000 to 23,000 numerical superiority now possessed by the enemy. The first group, the marines, had arrived on November 11 in a convoy commanded by Rear Admiral Norman Scott. Even as they hurried ashore, the enemy struck with the two air raids which ended the aerial doldrums and underlined Halsey's warning to Vandergrift. The only damage was in near misses suffered by transport Zalin, while eleven enemy aircraft were shot down against seven Wildcats lost. The second group, led by Admiral Turner and carrying the 182nd Infantry Regiment, was due to arrive the following day, November 12. So also, Admiral Halsey learned, would the aircraft and battleships of Admiral Kondo's huge fleet. Only Enterprise, still needing ten days of repairs, Battleship South Dakota also crippled, and Washington, two cruisers and eight destroyers could offset this powerful enemy concentration. Halsey ordered them back. On November 11, CBs and Vulcan crew and all, Enterprise stood out of Noumea. She made the open sea with her decks still shaking and echoing to air hammers, with welder's arcs still sparking, with a big bulge in her right side forward, without watertight integrity and one oil tank still leaking, and with her forward elevator still jammed as it had been since the bomb at Santa Cruz broke in half. Fortunately, the elevator was stuck at the flight deck level, or at least it was thought to be. No one, not even Bull Halsey, would have dared to press the down button to find out. If the elevator went down and did not come up again, there would be a big square hole in the flight deck and Enterprise would be useless. Thus, depending on her after elevators to bring planes to and from the hangars below, Enterprise sailed back to battle only half a carrier. With her, though, were screening ships powerful enough to take on Admiral Kondo's sluggers, if they could get there in time, if. This time there would be no complicated Japanese army timetable of attack to work in their favour. This time all depended on a favourable wind. If it blew from the north, Enterprise could launch her planes without having to turn around. But if it blew from the south, the big ship would have to turn into the wind to launch. Leaving Noumea behind and entering radio silence, Admiral Kincaid stood bareheaded on Big E's bridge and saw that the luck of Santa Cruz had forsaken him. It was a south wind. Far to the north, the weather favoured the Japanese. At three o'clock in the morning of November 12, Admiral Abe had detached his battleships and three destroyers from Admiral Kondo's main body. He had sailed south for the shortlands, making rendezvous with Nagara and eleven more destroyers, among them Amatsukaze under Commander Hara. 
They sped down the slot to bombard Henderson Field, and they ran into a fortuitous rain squall. Thick clouds clotted overhead. Rain fell in sheets. The sky darkened as though night had fallen, and Abe jubilantly ordered his ships to keep on course at a steady eighteen knots. Some of Abe's staff officers aboard flagship Hie objected. Al, though the squall certainly would protect the ships against surprise attack, it also made it dangerous to keep ploughing ahead in complex formation. Admiral Abe had formed his fleet into a tight double crescent. Half the destroyers formed a leading arc about five miles ahead of Nagara and the other destroyers, which formed a second arc. Following in column were Hiei and Kirishima better than a mile apart. Some of Abe's officers thought the fleet should slow down, or else risk collision in the darkness, but Abe replied, We must maintain this speed to reach the target area in good time. Charging south almost blindly, his men sweating despite the drenching rain, Admiral Abe pressed ahead, and the covering squall stayed with him at the same speed. Twenty-four torpedo bombers headed yours. The message was from Paul Mason at Buin, and it was acted upon immediately by the second group of American ships in Iron Bottom Bay. Kelly Turner had brought them in early that morning of November 12. They had begun unloading hurriedly, and the 182nd Infantry was already ashore by the time Mason's warning was received. A few minutes later, the Wildcats were taking off and Turner had broken off unloading. He set his transports in two parallel columns of three ships each and sailed them toward Savo. Around them cruisers and destroyers bristled with anti-aircraft barrels. Shortly after two o'clock, the Bettys were sighted circling over eastern Florida Island. They had formed two groups, north and south, to make the customary anvil attack from both sides. Turner deliberately baited the northern group by turning right to give them his ship's broadsides. The Bettys came boring in. A ferocious storm of steel swept among them. One by one they began to crash into the sea, but many of them still dropped their torpedoes. Turner swung his ships left. Only his narrow sterns beckoned to the Bettys, and their torpedoes ran harmlessly by either side of the transports. To the south, wildcats from Henderson ripped through the second group. Eight minutes after the enemy attack began, it was over, and only one of the twenty-four Bettys and five of eight escorting zeros had survived. Destroyer Buchanan, damaged during that storm of American anti-aircraft fire, was put out of action and sent home, while the heavy cruiser San Francisco had been slightly damaged by an enemy suicider who had deliberately crashed into the after-control station. Satisfied, Kelly Turner turned his ships around and resumed unloading. Hiroaki Abe was jubilant. He actually chortled his delight with, this blessed squall. His spirits rose higher upon receiving a report from the scout plane he had launched before entering the storm. It said, More than a dozen warships seen off Lunga. Abe smiled and said, If heaven continues to side with us like this, we may not even have to do business with them. Heaven, it seemed, had no intention of deserting him, for the storm still raged around his ships. Rainfall on Guadalcanal muffled Carlson's raiders in their approach to an unsuspecting company of Japanese. Guided by Sergeant Major Vuza, the Rattlers had moved stealthily up narrow native trails to the tiny village of Asimana on the upper Metapona River. They saw, to their satisfaction, that many of the enemy were bathing in the river. Colonel Carlson waited patiently until his men were in position. Then he spoke one word. Fire! There were only a few minutes of massacre. Not one of one-twenty Japanese soldiers survived. The raiders left their unburied bodies there to rot in the jungle, quickly resuming their pursuit of the harried Colonel Shoji. The prospect of foul weather as a cloak to conceal the movement of the Tokyo Express did little to cheer Rear Admiral Raizo Tanaka, sortieing from the shortlands that afternoon. Aboard flagship Hayashio, Tanaka led twelve destroyers, eleven transports and fourteen thousand men toward Tassafaronga. But he had no faith in the fickle Solomon's weather, and he also still thought that it was foolhardy to attempt to reinforce Guadalcanal in the face of Henderson's air power. 
Tanaka did not think that Abe would be able to demolish the field any more than Kurita had done so a month ago, and he wondered how many of his ships were going to survive. As Tanaka's ships neared Bougainville, the weather began clearing. Jack Reed was on the run. Having been warned by his scouts that the Japanese at Buka Passage were coming after him, he had notified Australia and been advised to flee, maintaining radio silence. Reed moved confidently into the high mountains on northern Bougainville. On the second day of his flight, November 12, a hot, hazy morning sun turned into an afternoon downpour. Reed and his scouts and the carriers bearing the teleradio slipped and swore while climbing higher to elude the pursuing Japanese. They reached a mountain peak just as the rain stopped. Sunlight poured through a hole in rapidly dissolving clouds. The mists parted and the horizon became clear. Sailing down it in orderly formation were eleven large Japanese transports protected by twelve destroyers. They were heading southeast. Jack Reed ordered his radio set up immediately and began broadcasting. Although the storm was staying with Hiroaki Abe, he had no reason to be so confident. An American Catalina had sighted and reported him early that morning, even as he made rendezvous with Commander Hara's column, and now Jack Reed had warned Kelly Turner of the Tokyo Express's approach. Turner realised immediately that this was the enemy's big push. Abe's big ships were either out to sink Turner's transports or bombard Henderson Field. Kelly Turner was confident that he could lead the transports, already 90% unloaded, south to safety. But what of Henderson Field? It must not be bombarded. It must not, because the planes of Cactus Air Force would then be unable to rise to intercept the enemy reinforcements, the heart of the entire Japanese operation. The planes from Enterprise would not be able to land on Guadalcanal to join them, and because one more day, at least, must be gained to allow Admiral Kincaid's powerful battleships time enough to enter the battle. But to save the airfield, to gain the day, to stop the powerful enemy on this ominous and onrushing night of Thursday the 12th and Friday the 13th, Kelly Turner had only two heavy and three light cruisers and eight destroyers. Nevertheless, he ordered them to halt the enemy, to stop the bombardment at all costs. Turner gave command of this force to Rear Admiral Daniel Callaghan. Admiral Callaghan had been Vice Admiral Gormley's Chief of Staff. It was Callaghan who had sat in silence at the acrimonious conference in the Fijis, during which Frank Jack Fletcher had curtly advised Turner and Vandergrift that they would receive minimum carrier support for the invasion of Guadalcanal. After Halsey had relieved Gormley, bringing his own chief of staff with him, Callaghan had gone back to sea. He belonged there, handsome with his shock of thick white hair and his jet black eyebrows, his large dreamy eyes and straight strong features. He might have been an ancient Celtic wanderer sailing a tossing coracle towards some undiscovered shore. Even his men idolised him, as does not happen often in any navy, and they called him Uncle Dan. But he had neither the experience nor the training for the mission given to him by Turner. Callaghan was chosen because he was senior to Norman Scott, the victor of Cape Esperance, who was also in the bay aboard his flag cruiser Atlanta. Scott's very victory also seems to have had inordinate influence on Callaghan, for he formed his ships in the same sort of column which had crossed the T on Aritomo Goto a month before. Americans had yet to learn that the column was not the best formation to employ against the night-fighting, torpedo-firing Japanese. But it was chosen because of Cape Esperance, because it made manoeuvring in narrow waters less risky, and because, presumably, it made communication between ships easier. So Callaghan set his ships in column, destroyers, Cushing, Laffey, Sterrett and O'Bannon in the lead, heavy cruisers, Atlanta, San Francisco and Portland, followed by lights Helena and Juno in the centre, and in the rear, destroyers Aaron Ward, Barton, Monson and Fletcher. Unfortunately, Callaghan did not make good use of his best radar ships. They were not in the lead. Moreover, Atlanta with inferior radar was ahead of San Francisco with excellent radar. Finally, no plan of battle was issued. Nevertheless, for all of these oversights and omissions, the Americans led by Callaghan and Scott did possess that single quality which, so often in this desperate struggle, 
had extricated the unwary or unwise from a defeat of their own devising. And that was valour. The Tokyo Express was turning around. Shortly before midnight, Admiral Tanaka received word from Combined Fleet that the landing at Tassafaronga had been delayed until the morning of November 14. Admiral Mikawa was going to follow up Admiral Abe's bombardment by shelling Henderson Field on the night of November 13, rather than on the morning of that day. From flagship Hayashio came the signal to reverse course and retire to the shortlands. There was tension on Guadalcanal. It was almost a living quality, like the gases composing the atmosphere. It was a quivering electric dread attuned to the jagged flashes of lightning flitting over the island in the wake of the clearing rain. It was brittle, like the emergent bright stars overhead. General Vandergrift felt it. He was aware of Abe's approach and of the outgunned fleet which Admiral Callaghan had to oppose him. The general's staff also knew that this was the night. They went to bed not only fully clad, as was customary on Guadalcanal, but wearing pistol belts and clutching hand grenades. Some of them expected to use these in the morning. So did all of Vandergrift's men, crouching beside their guns or perched on the edge of their holes. They spoke in low voices, often pausing to glance fearfully at the sky or to look furtively over their shoulders. It was as though they expected the enemy from every quarter. Upon the sinking of the new moon beneath the dark mountains, their voices became hushed and whispering. Out on the bay, a nine-knot easterly breeze blew gently into the faces of Callaghan's lookouts. At ten o'clock, Callaghan saw Turner's transports safely out of the eastern entrance and reversed course toward Savo. His ships were still in column. He would make no attempt to flank the approaching A-Bay to launch torpedoes. It was to be a straight-ahead plunge aimed at the enemy battleships. It was now Friday the 13th, and Admiral Abe's divine squall had fallen behind. Hiei and Kirishima and their fifteen sister furies had sailed away from the storm after the Admiral had reformed his scattered formation. At half-past one, one of Amatsukaze's lookouts cried, Small island, sixty degrees to left. Commander Hara looked to his left and saw the black round silhouette of Savo Island. Prepare for gun and torpedo attack to starboard, Hara shouted. Gun range, 3,000 metres. Torpedo firing angle, 15 degrees. Aboard Hiei, Admiral Abe was studying reports. General Hiakutake's headquarters had radioed that the rain had cleared on Guadalcanal. Scout planes had taken off from Bougainville. There were still no reports of enemy ships. Confident and elated, Abe ordered Hiei and Kirishima to prepare for bombardment. Type 3 shells, thin-skinned 2,000-pound projectiles each containing hundreds of incendiary bombs, were stacked on the decks around the 14-inch gun turrets. A quarter hour later, from Hiei's own masthead lookout came the frantic shout, Four black objects ahead, look like warships, five degrees to starboard, 8,000 metres unsure yet. From Heath's bridge came the cry, is 8,000 correct? Confirm. It may be 9,000, sir. Hiroaki Abe was stunned. He had thought to bombard Guadalcanal unchallenged. He had piled the decks of his precious battleships with huge shells that needed but a single enemy hit to detonate them and turn Hiei and Kirishima into floating holocausts. Replace all those incendiaries with armour piercing, he yelled. Set turrets for firing forward. Abe staggered to his chair and waited in agony. It would take at least ten minutes to change over, and the range between forces was closing rapidly. The Americans had sighted the Japanese, and they had sighted them first. Cushing at the head of the column had nearly collided with onrushing Yudachi and Harusame. Lieutenant Commander Edward Parker flashed the word and turned hard left to avoid collision. Behind him, his quick turn had piled up the American column. What are you doing? Admiral Callahan asked Atlanta, directly ahead of him. Avoiding our own destroyers, came the reply. It was then that Heath's lookout sighted the Americans, then that the gunners and seamen aboard Hiei and Kirishima rushed from their battle stations to haul the vulnerable Type 3 shells below, stampeding the magazines, pushing and kicking each other to get at the armour-piercing shells lodged deep inside, 
and it was then that confusion in Admiral Callahan's column became compounded. Excited voices began crackling over the talk between ships. Reports of target bearings multiplied, but no one could tell if they were true bearings or merely relative to the reporting ships. No one knew which target to take under fire or when. From Little Cushing still out in the lead came the voice of the destroyer leader, Commander Thomas Stokes, pleading, Shall I let them have a couple of fish? Affirmative, came the reply, but it was too late. Yudachi and Harusame had raced off into the darkness. Four minutes had passed before Callahan gave the order. Stand by to open fire. Another precious four minutes were to slip by before he bellowed, Commence fiffing! Give em hell, boys! And then, with surprise squandered and opportunity lost, the Americans called upon their last resource their valour and went plunging full tilt toward the Mastodonic foe. One of the most furious sea fights in all history had begun. Ashore on Guadalcanal, veterans of the campaign Japanese as well as American looked at each other in open-mouthed, overawed incredulity. Never before had the iron tongues of midnight bayed with such a maniacal clanging. Out there, giants clad in foot-thick steel were contending with one another, and never before had the thunder of their blows rolled so mightily over glistening Black Bay water. Scarlet star shells shot into the sky with the horrible beauty of hell. Searchlight beams licked out like great pale criss-crossing tongues. Ships in silhouette, big and small, plunged wildly toward each other, heeled away, dashed in and out of the smoke, blew up, blazed, vanished or reappeared with spouts of white and orange gushing from their guns. The surface of Iron Bottom Bay was like polished black marble shot with the bubbles of torpedo wakes, swirled with the foaming trails of careening ships, splashed with the red or the yellow of burning vessels. And above the roar and reverberation of the battle came the voice of Admiral Callahan crying, We want the big ones, boys! We want the big ones! A trio of American destroyers was charging the big ones. They had broken through AB's screen and taken on Great Hie. Cushing in the van lucid a spread of torpedoes from a half-mile range, missing, but forcing Hie to turn away. But then Cushing was illuminated in searchlight beams and enemy shells began to take her apart. Lafay swept in so close that she narrowly avoided collision. Heath's pagoda-like masts swayed over the little American as she dashed past, pouring a torrent of automatic shell fire into Heath's decks. Fires broke out aboard the big Japanese. But then Hie bellowed, and little Laffe began to burn. O'Bannon bored in last. She came in so close that Hie could not depress her fourteen-inch guns to shoot at her. Great shells howled harmlessly over O'Bannon's masts, while her gunners raked the Japanese with guns aimed in the light of her flames. Then O'Bannon was gone, shearing sharply left to avoid burning La Fay, tossing life jackets to sailors struggling in the water as she passed. Now San Francisco was battering Hie, but the enemy battleship thundered back. Fourteen inches tore into San Francisco's bridge to kill Admiral Callaghan and almost every American there. Norman Scott was also dead. Atlanta had been the first to be caught in enemy searchlights. With her port bridge clearly illuminated, bracketing warships gave her her death blows and killed the hero of Cape Esperance. Thereafter the fight became a melee. It was a free-for-all, ship for ship and shot for shot, with Japanese firing upon Japanese and American upon American. Every ship but Fletcher was hit, Barton blew up, Monson sank, Cushing and Laffey were lost, and so were the cruisers Atlanta and Juno, the latter finished off by a Japanese submarine as she tried to stagger home from battle. But the Japanese were fleeing. Mighty Kirishima, late to enter the battle, was already streaking north at the head of a general retirement. Every one of Abe's ships had been staggered. Yudachi was sinking, and so was Akatsuki. Amatsukaze had been battered. A cascade of shells had fallen flashing around Commander Hara on his bridge, cutting down his men, blowing his executive officer over the side but leaving his legs behind, and so crippling the ship that Amatsukaze had to be steered manually. Slowly, in the dawn lighting that glassy metallic sea, dragging herself past survivors lying burned, wounded and dazed on their life rafts, 
or struggling to keep afloat in oily, debris-laden, shark-infested waters, little Amatsukaze made her way home. Off his port bow, Hara saw Hie. The great ship was dying. She was almost dead in the water, crawling with jammed rudder in a wide, aimless circle. Marine bombers from Henderson Field were already slashing at her. They shot down the eight zeros flying cover above the battleship, while Major Joe Sailor knocked out High AV's remaining anti-aircraft turret with a well-planted bomb, after which they bombed and torpedoed her without interruption. But she refused to go down. We've got to sink her, Henderson's pilots cried, landing to rearm and refuel and to return to the attack. If we don't, the admirals will stop building carriers and start building battleships again. Again and again they struck at Hie, but on and on she crawled, glowing like a great red gridiron, circling and circling while destroyers ministered to her like cubs caring for a wounded lioness, until, at nightfall, after survivors and Admiral Abe had been taken off, the Japanese scuttled her and she sank with a hiss and an oil slick two miles long. But on that morning of Friday the 13th, the heart of Commander Hara was heavy with grief as he saw the Americans hurtling down from the skies. They came, he knew, from that Henderson field which had not been bombarded. Nevertheless, Gunichi Mikawa was already coming down. The slot determined to succeed where Hiroaki Abe had failed. Admiral Halsey was aware of Mikawa's approach, and he planned to intercept him with the battleships from Admiral Kincaid's Enterprise force. To send these capital ships into the narrow and treacherous waters of Iron Bottom Bay was not, as Halsey knew, consonant with accepted naval doctrine. But the safety of Henderson Field seemed to him well worth the risk of his heavies, and so, on November 13, confident that the winds favoured Kincaid, he broke radio silence to tell him to put South Dakota and Washington and four destroyers under Rear Admiral Willis Lee with instructions to lay an ambush east of Savo Island. Kincaid replied, From Lee's present position, impossible for him to reach Savo before eight tomorrow. Halsey was stunned. Mikawa would have a clear path to Henderson Field. In the early afternoon of Friday the 13th, the Tokyo Express moved toward Guadalcanal again. Tanaka's eleven transports were in a four-column formation sailing at eleven knots, with a dozen destroyers deployed to the front and either side. Tanaka was still in flagship Hayashio, which means fast-running tide. The tide, it seemed to Tanaka, who had heard of the disaster which had overtaken Abe, was running fast against Japan. At eight o'clock that morning, Enterprise was still two eighty miles south of Henderson Field, but she launched planes, some of which reached Guadalcanal in time to join the attack on Hie, and continued to steam north. All day long, Big E remained buttoned up with her men at battle stations, while her scout planes fanned out in search of the Japanese carriers and her combat air patrol flew overhead. But no enemy ships or aircraft were sighted. At dusk, her men were secured from general quarters and went below. Mighty South Dakota and Washington and their destroyers slid away from the screen and vanished into the darkness ahead. They could not stop Mikawa tonight, but they would at least be in the battle zone by tomorrow. Enterprise ran steadily north at twenty-five knots. It was happening again. It was not supposed to happen. Callahan and Scott were supposed to have ended it. But there it was. Louis the Laos, flares, the lethal thunder and lightning of the sea cannonade, and flames engulfing Henderson Field. Admiral Mikawa had brought six cruisers and six destroyers down to Savo. With flagship Chokai, Kinugasa, Isuzu and two destroyers, Mikawa guarded the western gate at Savo, while heavy cruisers Suzuya and Maya, escorted by light cruiser Tenryu and four destroyers, entered the bay to bombard. They hurled about a thousand rounds of eight-inch shell into the airfield, until six little torpedo boats under Lieutenant Hugh Robinson crept from Tulagi Harbour to launch torpedoes at them and scare them off. Mikawa sailed jubilantly north on that morning of November 14, delighted to see his success celebrated in the intercepted plain-language radio message which Vandergrift had sent to Halsey, being heavily shelled. In Washington, the news that the Japanese had once again penetrated American defences to batter Henderson.
Field produced a pessimism and a tension unrivaled throughout the campaign. Upon receipt of reports that heavy Japanese reinforcements were sailing down the slot unopposed, even President Roosevelt began to think that Guadalcanal might have to be evacuated. Mikawa's guns had wrecked 18 American planes and had churned up the airstrips, but they had not knocked out the field entirely, nor had Admiral Kondo sent any aircraft from Hiyo or Junyo down to protect Mikawa from likely pursuit. At dawn of the 14th, while fires still raged and ammunition dumps exploded, pilots raced to their armed planes and took off. They found Mikawa's ships. They put two torpedoes into big Kinugasa, leaving her to be sunk by pilots from Enterprise, who also bombed Chokai, Maya and Isuzu. Admiral Mikawa, who had intended to provide indirect cover for Admiral Tanaka's ships, was forced to retire to the shortlands. Tanaka sailed south all alone. Since dawn, when a few flying fortresses had been driven off by covering zeros, Tanaka the Tenacious had stood on Hayashio's bridge, anxiously scanning the skies. He had seen flights of enemy planes, but they did not attack him. He conjectured that they had gone after Mikawa. He was positive that they had not been frightened off by the handful of zeros circling overhead. All, it seemed, that Admiral Kondo to the north could spare from the crowded decks of Hiyo and Junyo. At noon, Tanaka's ships were only 150 miles from Guadalcanal, and it was then that the American planes came hurtling out of the sun, and the slaughter known as the Buzzard Patrol began.